The whole idea of honoring someone for being in heaven or someone to, to look up to, to maybe call upon for prayers, like that goes before the Catholic Church. We don't go to a saint instead of God. We go to the altar of God with the saints. Thank you for joining us, Father Sullivan. No, it's good to be here. Thank you for interviewing me. Before we start, can you just give us a little background of who you are and what your assignment is? Yeah, so my name is Father Christopher Sullivan. I'm a parish priest actually right here in Our Lady of Victory, which is in Floral Park. I'm the associate pastor, so I'm the second guy in the totem pole. Uh, in addition to that, I am the chaplain of Adelphi University, which is a local college. And I've been doing that for a couple months now. And then, you know, I do various things for the diocese. I run youth camps and do vocation and sermon retreats. Um, but I'm a priest. That's, that's why I am. Awesome. So today's topic, we're going to talk about Catholicism and saints. Uh, one, I had this one experience in college where uh, I met someone who was Christian but wasn't Catholic. And I asked, I was like, oh, why are you not Catholic? And they said, you know, I, I worship God. I don't worship saints. And I thought, I don't know, I thought that was interesting. I was like, huh, okay. Uh, usually people bring up other things before that. Um, but I guess it's, it's something on a lot of people's minds. Yeah. So um, what, what is a saint in the most like, basic definition? Well, the most basic definition is a saint is someone in heaven. You know, saint comes from the Latin word sanctus, which means holy. So who are the holiest people? They're the ones in, in heaven. That's what a saint is. So how long has the church been like, officially recognizing saints and declaring mm -hmm. saints? Well, I guess officially would be a different question, but the whole idea of honoring someone for being in heaven or someone to, to look up to, to maybe call upon for prayers, like that goes before the Catholic Church. Like you think about the Jewish people, like they would call the, the patriarchs or fathers, like Abraham, our father in faith. They're not worshiping Abraham. They would think about Moses. They would think about Elijah or Elisha or all the prophets. They would think about David and all his Psalms. Even when Jesus comes, they, they think about well, maybe he's like David or maybe he's like Moses or Elijah. And so it's very much in the culture and in the faith that when Jesus comes, well, they're not going to cut that out. That's been part of their heritage of looking up to those who have really gone before him, who are holy, who are saintly. Um, so in the beginning, you know, Jesus dies, resurrects, and the church is founded with his apostles. And what do they do? The, the first people that pass away, they look up to them as well. And so the idea of saints is just, it's part and parcel with the beginning of the Catholic Church. And everywhere a church is founded by St. Paul, these communities raise up people who have been holy, who are saints, to, to recognize that they're in heaven. And sure, over time, the church wants to kind of codify and have that canon, that, that rule, the canonization of that process. And that takes some time, maybe about six or 700 years, to get the actual process. Um, but if we think about it, if something needs to be codified or rule needs to happen, it's not because it nothing's ever happened before it. It's because it's been happening so much and so often, they say, okay, we need to get some rules on this one. Um, so yeah, it's way from the beginning that we've had saints. What's that process to become canonized? How does that work and what sure. are the different steps? Well, I guess the first step would be uh, to live a holy life, right? That's a pretty good first step to have. Uh, the, the second step's probably the toughest. Uh, the person has to die, so that's the first, you know, big, big really change. Uh, so once a person's died, we'll say, um, you know, God forbid, but you, know, you die tomorrow, right? Uh, so everyone uh, loved Nick. They had said he's a great guy. So the first step is what's called a, a cult of, of worship, right? People who, who love you, people who would say, this guy, was he was a saint. He was holy, right? Um, and what happens is if there's enough people in an area, in a diocese, a bishop would say, we need to let everyone else know about Nick. We need, like, everyone needs to know how holy this guy was so they can be like him, so they can look towards him. And so what the bishop would do is he would put together a testimony of someone's life, and he would send it to the Vatican, to the Holy Father. And if that happens, if the Pope says, yes, we're going to read this, we're going to look into it, he's called what's a servant of God, which means what you might think, he was a servant of God. Then they look into his life and they, you know, check out was he really heroic in his virtue? And if he was, they say that he is venerable, that he had a venerable life. Then the question becomes, okay, we know he had a good life on earth, but is he in heaven? We want to know. 
right? If we're going to put this person forward to the entire world, we want proof. And the proof we look for are miracles, right? So when the person gets one miracle, we would say it's attributed to them. The, the man or woman is called uh, blessed. They're beatified. And then the second miracle they might get, then they have that really high honor of being called saint. So it wasn't just a fluke, it was this person is in heaven and he's interceding for us and doing miracles. So we know that they live a holy life and that they're in heaven, so we call him a saint. How are the miracles verified? Well, you know, it's probably tougher and tougher to verify a miracle now. Now what they do is that if it's a medical miracle, which is usually um, what's used for canonization, of course there are miracles of faith or unbelief that becomes belief, uh, but those are hard to scientifically prove. But if, say, if someone um, is sick and they're dying and the doctor comes back and says, there is no medical explanation as to how this happened. And then you find out, well, this person's praying to blessed whomever. Well, they're going to bring that medical case to the Vatican. And the Vatican will have a panel of, of doctors, of scientists, who are going to look into it. And they all need to agree that, say, that there is no medical evidence um, that this, this could have happened. Um, now, it's tougher and tougher today because certain miracles that maybe would have been used 10, 20 years ago, um, they won't even let happen because there might be one, just 1% 1 of a chance that science helped it. So, for example, it used to be uh, if you were healed of cancer, which is, you know, miraculous, um, that they would use that as a miracle. But now so often people go in for chemotherapy and the church would say, well, if you have one hour, one minute of it, well, then there's that one millionth of a chance that that's what cured you. So we'll say, we're not going to do that. But like, I can give you an example of a, a guy who um, he had osteoporosis and all the bones in his leg had disintegrated. And he started praying to, to Our Lady. And he woke up one morning and his bone had grown back. And in fact, uh, they did medical uh, checkups on him for the next 30 years because it has to be lasting. And over the course of 30 years, all the bones in his body got weaker, as they normally would, but that leg got stronger. And we know how to do a lot of things in science. Uh, we don't grow bones yet. Um, those are the type of miracles that we're um, using for sainthood. Okay. So saints usually have like a patron, or like they have something that they're associated with, like Thomas Aquinas and students. How does that get decided in this process? Yeah, so I don't think there's any uh, like official, like a pope sits down and says, you know, Saint Kukafas, he's gonna be the patron saint of slides, right? Uh, what it is, is we look at a saint's life and that saint might have something that was special to them. So like Saint Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest teachers, if not the greatest teacher in the, the Catholic faith. And so when someone dies, we know that too. And so we might say, well, who would be interested in school students? Well, Saint Thomas loved school during his life. He's not gonna stop in his death. So we might look towards him. Or it might be someone who we can see ourselves in. So, for example, St. Thomas More, he's a patron of lawyers because he was a lawyer. And so if you're a lawyer saying, who's going to understand my plight as a lawyer? St. Thomas More, because he's one of us. So he can be our patron. So sometimes there are maybe official patrons, and I think there's a lot of unofficial patron saints. What about feast days? Where do feast days get played in? How are those decided? Do they really matter? What's the significance of those? Yeah, so feast days are days in the life of the church where we decide to remember a saint or an idea or an event in the life of Jesus. And so as we think, as Catholics, we have a calendar set for us. I know some you know, Protestants, evangelical churches, they can kind of pick the passages in the Bible they want. As Catholics, we're given a set of feast days ideas we're going to celebrate, of readings we're going to read, um, because it's not about us. It's that a universal church, and we're going to hear the entirety of the faith. And so a saint's feast day is usually the day they died, or it might be a day significant for them, where we get to hear about these amazing saints in the church. And in fact, because there's so many saints, probably like 10,000 or more, what they do is they put the best of the best saints on the calendar. And every now and again, they have to revamp, it'll take some off the calendar and they'll add new ones. And so what you get to do is you, you hear on Sunday, the life of Christ, you hear his teaching of the gospel and every day you hear the gospel. But then so often throughout the week, you hear how that gospel teaching is lived out. So like Jesus says to love the poor, and then you celebrate the feast of 
you know, St. Uh, Teresa of Calcutta, Mother Teresa, and you can say, wow, she lives out the gospel. And if she can do it, maybe I can do it too. So before you were saying that, like this spawns back to like very early church. So like people like St. Stephen, like the first martyr, was that like officially decided later? Or is it something that just kind of they went with as the church developed? Yeah, so in the early era of the church, there would have been sainthood by popular acclamation. Um, before there was that, you know, um, codified way by the Holy Father. But it would have been, you know, we kind of did it with St. John Paul II, where this man was so holy that everyone, even at his funeral, was saying, this, this man's a saint. And that's how it would have worked in the early age of the church. And then you were also saying, so like, like the hypothetical of me, right? Yeah, not yet. Not yet, hopefully, not yet. hopefully not yet. But uh, um, does someone, like, how does that work to get the bishop to write that? So like you said, the, the cult around them forms. Mm -hmm. So do people have to like collect things and then present it to the bishop? Yeah, so you would, uh, it always comes from the people, you know, the people who, who know this person the best. And so what you would collect would be maybe if he was a writer, you know, his writings. If you knew people who knew the man or woman personally, you get their testimonies. Um, you would have people maybe talk about their encounters. Or maybe sometimes you have healing during life, you know. I, I went to Nick and he prayed over me and I was healed miraculously of blindness. Um, all those are given to what's called a postulator, right? Someone who's going to put forth the cause, which usually you know, is the bishop in a diocese. And you know, if we're honest, usually it's a priest or a secretary that's doing all the day-to-day -day work. But you give it to the bishop because he's our representative to the Holy Father in Rome. So moving in now to how the saints are in the Catholic spiritual life. Um, one of the things that is constantly brought up is like Saint, uh, I'll go with Saint Paul's my confirmation, uh, Paul's my confirmation name. So like Saint Paul, pray for us. What is that really like implying and what does that mean by just saying that? It means you want Saint Paul to pray for you. Like, you know, yeah. like he's in heaven. He's yeah, you know, heaven. when we go to heaven, you know, some of the, the worst representations of heaven I ever see, it's like when I go to heaven, it's going to be all fishing. All right? When I go to heaven, it's going to be like, you know, a party nonstop. That is not heaven, right? Um, all of those good things in earth point towards the one perfect good thing, which is Jesus Christ, right? So in heaven, and we, we see this in the book of Revelation, what's happening? All the white-robed, you know, saints, the holy ones, are praying to God forever in heaven, right? And you have eternity enjoying that vision of God our Father. And so when we ask St. Paul to pray for us, he's already praying, right, to God. And we're saying, Paul, I know you're praying already. Could you remember me? Uh, and I think it's a beautiful thing. And, you know, it's not that crazy that we would do that. And we think about our own life, right? If you're having a hard day and you have that one really holy grandma, right, what are you going to do? Grandma, could you pray for us? Well, if you trust in grandma's prayers, why would we not trust in St. Paul's prayers? Okay, so like, I, I get that, but so, a lot of people have said to me, and I don't really know the right answer, well, why not just pray to God directly? Why do you need like this like third party to come in and like help you out with it? Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard that a lot, and I think maybe it's a misunderstanding that praying to a saint, or really it should be say through a saint, is never taking it apart from God. Um, I mean, we know what we're doing. Like, when I pray to St. Paul or St. Thomas, I'm not saying, God, I forget you, and I'm going to turn to St. Thomas. Like, I'm not being an uh, idolater, okay? Uh, but when we think about what Jesus said, right? Jesus tells us to pray, but he never tells us to pray alone, right? He tells us, you know, whenever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in your midst. Uh, he teaches us how to pray, right? He says, you know, go to your inner room, you know, you know be, be quiet, be silent. And he doesn't say, and then just talk to, to, to God, you, you, you and him alone. The next command is, pray like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, right? It's not my Father, it's, it's our Father. It's deliver us from heaven. Like we are in a community of believers, we're, we're a church, and that includes those who are in heaven with God. And so we don't go to a saint instead of God, we go to the altar of God with the saints, and, and that's why we're doing it. So because maybe we're not as afraid to go, or we have that much more confidence, or we just want to follow God's commands and pray together. So when people say things like, um, you know, they pray to St. Jude for a hopeless cause, or the thing where you bury a statue of St. Joseph like in your backyard to sell your house or something, is that all related to that same concept, or is that something different? Yeah, I think in, the, in its best form it is. 
uh, but sometimes maybe um, they, they do miss the mark. So the idea of using a particular saint is back to the idea of having a patron saint. You know, maybe you're struggling um, to be a good father, so you're gonna pray to Saint Joseph. Like, th that's fine. Or maybe you're gonna say, um, you know, Saint Jude loves people who have impossible causes. I'm gonna pray to him. Uh, sometimes it can get a little, I guess, messed up when people will say, um, if I bury a statue, I'll sell my house. You know, and I, I would agree with some people that say, well, that can be superstitious. Um, but you need to remember the saint. And so, I mean, I really can't tell if a person's remembering the saint or not, but that's, that's where those customs would come from. Having maybe a tangible way to be reminded of those prayers. Um, that's where those ideas of maybe using a statue to pray or lighting a candle might come from. So like as long as it doesn't become like a good luck charm. Yeah, that, I think that's kind of the, the, the cutoff. You don't want it to be a talisman or a good luck charm. Um, you know, and I probably, I don't know if it's in this one, but there's the, like the idea of a scapular, right? If you wear a little tiny medal to, to our blessed mother, um, that you'll go to heaven. It's not because the, it's a magic you know, medal. It's because if you wear it every single day and every single day over your heart is that prayer to God, well, you're going to be holier. Like that, that's kind of the deeper meaning of those practices. What about altars to saints? So like I'm thinking right now of the Crypt Chapel at the seminary in Huntington, right, where they have like the St. Thomas Aquinas altar, the St. Paul one, St. Peter, and all these different ones. Um, why, why do we do that? Well, you know, you can think maybe um, the biblical example than the lived example. So like when we look in the Bible in the book of Revelation, which is really, uh, I think it's an overlooked uh, book, but it's one of the most Catholic books. It's all about the mass, the heavenly lit liturgy. What, is, what does he say that he sees in heaven? He sees this ho the holy ones, the saints, right, under the altar of the Lamb. And so we have saints in, in our altars, right? And in the early days of the church, they would have to celebrate Mass in the catacombs, right? The, the, the faith was illegal. And so when they're saying Mass, they are literally saying it over the bones of those who are holy, those who gave their life for their faith. And so when they eventually get to move out of the catacombs into churches, well, they don't want to stop that practice. They don't want to say, well, let's forget all the saints and we'll move on. They say, no, let's bring them with us. And so very often, if you go to like a church in Rome, you might see an entire saint under an altar. Or if you, if you go to like an altar like this, you might have a stone that has part of the saint in it. To remind ourselves that we are called to live out a life like them. And we are called to worship forever, not just now, but in heaven with God, as they are doing right now. So you said there's a piece of the saint in the altars, so, so a relic. Um, I've had, I have, a, I have a really good friend who, he's very faithful and like we go to church together and stuff, but like he thinks relics are like really weird. And I've, I've had a couple of people say that to me, like, you know, like, why don't we just bury the person? Why do we like take up, like, this might sound weird, but why do we take up like pieces of them? So what's the basic idea for the practice of relics? Well, you know, when, when I think of relics, maybe, and I understand some people think it's a little weird, um, but I, I think it's one of the most natural things we do as, as Catholics, right? Um, that idea of wanting something tangible to remember someone. You know, when I was a little kid, I uh, loved baseball. I mean, I still do, but you know, the young kids love baseball. And I could tell you every single New York Met that ever played for the Mets. I, I knew the order, like all that stuff. And um, I, I idolized certain baseball players, like Babe Ruth, right? Everyone loves Babe Ruth. And, you know, I could just think about Babe Ruth. I could just read whatever he'd done. But one day my dad said, do you want to go to Cooperstown? Do you want to go to the Baseball Hall of Fame? And you can see Babe Ruth's bat. You can see his glove. You can see his shoes. And I was over the moon, right? Because Babe Ruth had only ex ever existed in like the TV or in old movies. But when I went to Cooperstown, I, I could actually see a tangible reminder of Babe Ruth, right? Uh, the saints and the relics, like that's kind of the same thing. Like we can think about St. Francis Xavier or whomever, um, and maybe because they lived a thousand years ago, like they were just way out there. Like they're in our imagination. We can read about them. We can hear about them. But like to see part of St. Francis Xavier, like I know his, his arm's really popular relic and say, oh my goodness, like that is the arm that baptized a hundred thousand Christians. Like it, it makes it more realistic for us. And, and I know maybe it might sound odd, but there are people who, when their relatives pass away, uh, maybe for different reasons, but they, they want a, a way to be close to them, right? They, they, they go to the grave, they want to be next to them. 
Um, if, if only we could all go to the grave of all the saints, but it, as Catholics, we have that kind of maybe odd, but kind of unique and special practice of taking part of the saint and bringing it across the world so that all of us can worship um, God through the intercession of Pius X or St. Francis. So with the, with the relics, how do you like, like, how do you make sure they're not fake? What's the process for determining which ones are real, which ones aren't? So, I mean, I've read, I remember reading in high school some, like, literature where that was, like, a part of the story, like, faking relics and things like that. Yeah, no, there's definitely a bunch of jokes like that. Like, if we took uh, all the fragments of the true cross and put them together, you could build an ark out of it. Um, yeah, what, what, what happened now, if, if you got a, a relic, um, you can only get one from the Vatican. Um, you can't buy one. or I mean, you could buy one anyway. Don't do it, okay? It's a... You get excommunicated. So don't, for, don't buy a relic. Don't, online. You know, don't sell a relic. Don't okay? sell or buy a relic yeah, online. We said it here. Don't so. do that, okay? okay? It doesn't belong in a museum. It belongs in a church, okay? okay? Uh, no, but it's like if you have a relic, if you went to our church, um, it has paperwork, right? It would have the seal of whatever bishop was at the, the tomb when they took the relic from the saint, right? So a, a friend of mine, he was at um, the, when they opened up the casket of Blessed Pierre Giorgio Versati. Right? And so there were people documenting what had happened. And so if we found a, a relic in our church, we could get the piece of paperwork and we could trace back where it came from. So I've had it explained to me before that there are like different classifications of relics. What are those classifications and how is that determined? Yeah, so there are uh, three classes of relics. And it's, you know, it's not terribly confusing, but there's first degree, second degree, third degree. So a first class relic would be part of the saint. So maybe it's their, their hair or part of their bone, um, something that actually is part of them. The second class relic would be something that was um, tied to that saint throughout their, their life. So maybe it's the clothing they wore, or if they're a martyr, maybe it's an instrument of torture, uh, which is always a fun relic to have. And then the third class would be something that has touched one of those relics. And so, for example, I know there are a lot of third class relics of Mother Teresa or Padre Pio, where you might touch a, a glove to a piece of clothing uh, so that everyone could have maybe a relic of the saint. So like my rosaries, like I went to, I went to like a relic expedition in my parish and like I put my, so that would be third class? Third class relic. Because I, okay. Yeah. That's pretty neat. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we joked that uh, our bishop was baptized uh, by B uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen, who's on his way to be a saint. So I guess our bishop is a, a, a third class relic. Bishop Barris is baptized. Yes. Wow. Okay. That's cool. Okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. Awesome. So what about, um, I know like a lot of people have claimed about relics, mm -hmm. like doing miracles. Sure. Is it God doing the miracle or is it the saint with the relic doing the miracle? Yeah. So it would always be God, whether it's the relic or if you're just saying prayers, uh, you know, to God through a saint, it, it's always God. God is always behind every single miracle. He's behind everything that's good. Um, but what he, he does is he allows us to go to him through our human means. Um, so it is God. It's not a magical relic. It's a relic that reminds us to pray to God, and God gives us that grace. So the relic's only doing it because God is allowing. He's doing it through the relic. God is doing it through his grace. The relic is our um, maybe conduit to pray to God. Okay. So it's, yeah, it's not... It's not like an Indiana Jones movie. It's not being zapped out of the arm of St. Francis Xavier. Okay. Though if it, if it was, I would, I would watch that. That'd be fun. <laughs> okay. Um, what about uh, statues to saints? So like here, I mean, we have a statue of the Blessed Mother over there. Um, I know at my parish, they have a lot of saint statues in like the side areas. Is that good, bad, idolatry, not? How does that work? Yeah, so I uh, definitely heard that one. You know, Catholics worship Mary. I, I see him in the statues, right? Uh, like there's a famous video of the, some pastor smashing a statue of, of Mary that's actually St. Therese of Lisieux. But yeah, like we're not doing that, right? We're not worshiping the, uh, the statues. I'm not sacrificing a cow to the statue. Um, what does the statue do? Statue reminds us um, to pray to God, reminds us of, of a person. Um, and it, it, I think it's also good to think about the different types of, of worship and prayer um, that one might do. Because uh, you know, maybe looking out from the outside, the person's kneeling there, and you don't know what they're saying in their heart, right? So what could it be? Well, it could be what's called um, latria, right? which means like the praise and worship given to God. There could be what's called a dulia, which is the honor given to a saint. And then there's uh, hyperdulia, the highest honor, which we would give to the Blessed Mother. And it might seem odd, like, well, why not just honor God, love God, and forget about the saints? 
Um, once again, because we don't do that as people. That's not how we work. So for example, um, if, if Nick, if you're going to take a nice young lady on a date, right, you, you want to marry her one day and you're going to go out to dinner, right? You're going to go dinner with your girlfriend, with her mom and her little sister. You're going to want to honor all three of those women, but you're going to do it in a very different way or else it would get weird, right? So you're going to give that, that highest praise, that highest love uh, to your beloved, right? to, the, to the young lady. But then because you love her, what are you going to do? You're going to buy flowers for her mom, right? You're going to give her that highest honor. And then because you're not a jerk, right? Maybe you're going to buy know, a piece of candy for her little sister. So when you go to dinner, you've now worshipped, right, your beloved. And then you've honored her mom and her sister. And because she loves her mom and she loves her sister, she now loves you more because you have love what she loves. And so when we go to a church and we see a statue of St. Joseph, of Mary, of St. Jude, right? We, we're not forgetting God. We're, we're loving him by loving the people he loves. And we're asking them to help us to love God as they love God as well. What about the communion of saints? I know that's said a lot at Mass. I think it's in the Creed. Mm -hmm. um, what, is that, what does that mean? Yeah, so the communion of, of saints is what we're all called to be. So there are canonized saints in heaven, the saints that we know of, and there are probably countless saints that we will never canonize because maybe they're not popular. Like I, I can think of a, you know, a handful, if not a dozen or, or so, parishioners. I, I've done their own funerals, right? They're never going to be canonized. Uh, but they were holy people. Like they are people who went to Mass every day, who said their prayers, who would pray for you, who would help the poor, uh, and they passed away, and maybe no one knew of it. Well, they are in heaven, right? They're part of what's called a communion of saints, that, that people who are united in communion, and you're united in their holiness, in their sanctity, right, in their sainthood. And we're all called to be part of that. We have a universal calling to be saints, to be holy, to be in heaven. That's what the communion of saints is. I've also seen like different images of the mass, like paintings and things like that, where it's like the priest is offering the bread, and then the saints are all like around him. Um, can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so when we think about Mass, it's not a recreation or like a, a play of what had happened. I know some people will say that, you know, Jesus died once for all, so why are we doing it again? Um, they're right, Jesus did die once for all, forever, right? And so when we go to Mass, we're not reinstituting, but rather we're making present again that which is eternal. And so there is one Mass, that one self-offering of the Father, of the Son to the Father through the Holy Spirit, which you know, starts on, on you know, Holy Thursday, it comes to Calvary, and continues forever in heaven. Like That's what's happening in heaven. You're not fishing. You're worshiping God forever in communion with Him. And so when we go to Mass at Our Lady of Victory or you know, whatever, St. Ladislaus or St. Lawrence, or whatever your, your home parish is, and the priest makes present the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ in the Holy Eucharist and offers it to God the Father through the Holy Spirit. He's uniting himself in that one eternal heavenly banquet. And so who is there? Well, all of us are there, right? Everyone who's in the church, but all the saints in heaven who are at that eternal banquet, they're present as well. That's why we don't just have holy union with God. We have that holy communion with all the saints in heaven. And then there's the souls in purgatory, right? But because we don't forget about them, that they take the graces that we offer to make them holy, to be, to be healed. Um, so even like when I say Mass on my day off, and maybe it's you know, just me and, and Jesus in, in the building, like I still turn around and I give a blessing at the end of Mass because I'm not alone. There, there are countless angels and saints uh, who are present at Mass. Um, so yeah, that's a good holy card you have. What about... Uh Confirmation names, I know it's big, and I mean, you have a school here and sure, sure the yeah. CCD. Um, are they, they're su usually supposed to pick a saint, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, supposed to pick a saint, yeah. yeah. Like, um, what, what's, what's the reasoning for that? I'm even also thinking of like, you know, like when the Pope picks a new name, mm -hmm. like how does all that come into play with this? Yeah, so I know not every country um, uses the, the custom of a confirmation name. A lot of them will just use their baptismal name. But the idea of using a saint name, just like a pope might pick a new name, or maybe a religious might pick a new name, it has that biblical idea, like Abram became Abraham, right? Because it, 
it, signif it signifies um, a new beginning, a new creation, and maybe a way that we're going to live. And so maybe you take the saint name of St. Paul as your confirmation name. My confirmation name is St. Thomas More. So I, wanted, I, I saw him and I thought he's a man of integrity. My parents had picked my baptismal name of Christopher, a bearer of Christ, which I guess as a priest is a pretty good name to have, the bearer of Christ. Um, but then I, when I was being confirmed, I said, I want to be like someone like St. Thomas More. And so I'm going to take him as kind of my new name to have that new creation and to have him pray for me. And yeah, it should be a saint. I know a lot of people might pick their, you know, a relative, which can be beautiful. You say, I thought my uncle was saintly, and so I'm going to maybe pick uh, Joseph as my, as my confirmation name, and because he's like Saint Joseph too. So that's, uh, that's kind of that custom. So just to, to kind of wrap this up, I mean, we've heard a lot about saints and all the different customs and how that developed and what we believe about them. Does it, does it really matter? Like, can you have a fulfilling spiritual life without saints? Uh, what should a Catholic do to fully engage in this aspect of the Catholic faith? Yeah, I mean, I guess you could go through your entire Catholic life without having the saints. Um, it'd be really boring. I mean, God has given us so much beauty, right? So many ways of knowing how to follow his call. You know, I always say that sin is boring. You know, like, I mean, there are only 10 commandments, right? I've heard enough confessions where I could probably guess what your sins are. Just, I mean, they got a one in 10 shot, right? Uh, but there are thousands and thousands of ways to be holy. Like, I, I'm never, like, not blown away when I hear the life of a saint. And it reminds me, like, I, I can do this. It, it's not just me trying to figure it out by myself. It, it's been done, and I can do it with their prayers and their intercessions. There are so many parts of our Catholic faith that will remind us of how great God is, and the saints are they're, they're way up there on one of those.